Yo, everybody. Welcome to Off Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics, brought to you by Sketch.com. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week we have a double guest week, as for the first time we have brothers on the show. They're the CCO and Editor-in-Chief and CEO and Publisher of Vault Comics, respectively. It's Adrian and Damian Wassel. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having us. to be here. So... I really want to start with your guys' titles. I know that's kind of a random place to start, but I want to know how you guys decided who got what title. Was it a coin flip, like rock, paper, scissors? How did you guys decide? I think the long and the short of it is I'm pretty good with spreadsheets and Adrian's pretty good with stories. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, I think our roles were pretty kind of naturally bifurcated from day one. Um, Damien makes sure that... Uh, the ship has actually got the sails on it and is pointed in the right direction and everybody's doing their jobs. And, uh, you know, I'm dreaming up places for us to, to go. (laughs) That's, that's sort of how we work. (laughs) That works out shockingly well that you guys have complementary skill sets in that way. That's, that's kind of amazing actually. Yeah. I think it's been, uh, um, I mean, Damien and I, like all siblings, you know, managed to fight some when we were younger but it's pretty much been the case our entire lives that uh we've we've worked extremely well um in concert and it's because we've always had this kind of complementary skill set and we're always willing to step out of the other person's way when we recognize like oh nope this is a this is a place that damien should handle things not a place that i should handle things yeah that seems like it'd be the tricky part because it's like I don't know. I always want to get in because I work in an advertising agency and I work on online social media. And for some reason, sometimes I think that I'm like, yeah, I know about TV spots. Let me help with that. And I'm like, no, I don't actually know about that. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Not everybody has got that, though. Sometimes people like to step in the other person's way. But uh, that's good that you guys don't do that. Um, Well, I told you before that I I don't want to go too deep into the origin story of Vault because you've answered that question like a million times. But I I do want to ask broadly, like, you know, I I read a lot about your background. You you guys have, you know, robust backgrounds with a lot of different directions you could have taken your careers. But why why comics? Why was that the thing you wanted to do? Um, I mean, to to try to wrap it up somewhat quickly, uh, just that crazy, insane passion that everybody in comics shares for the, for, for comics. Um, Damien and I are both voracious consumers of all nerddom and, uh, sci-fi and fantasy have been lifelong, uh, love affairs for both of us. Yeah. In, in a word for me, love, you know, perhaps unrequited love. We'll see (laughs) (laughs) that, that tale is yet to be told. But uh, Adrian and I have, uh, as as has come forth in other interviews, I'm the older brother here. So Adrian and I have loved comics since, you know, I was young and foisted them upon him. Mm -hmm. And we had a sort of singular opportunity to try to make something in in this business. And so we we took a solid go of it. I do think it's funny how like the the older brother so often leads the way or like older sibling in general, because it's like that seems like an origin story for a lot of creators I talk to. They're like, yeah, you know, my brother already had a bunch of comics or my sister already had a bunch of comics. And then I pick them up and I just start reading them. Next thing you know, I'm making my own comics. I'm like, how does that work out? But it sounds like it worked out for you guys, too. Yeah, it did. And, you know, as the younger sibling, it wasn't just Damien. It was uh, so our our cousin Nathan is a phenomenal illustrator uh, and artist and sequentialist. And he's and painter. He does it all. And uh, he just always he was always drawing and always painting. And so I fell in love with the visual side of storytelling, uh, watching him, not not just um, having the books around, but seeing somebody do it. And of course, like any kid, I, I, you know, pretended I would someday be an artist too. And I tried, but, uh, you know, I, I recognized fairly quickly that I didn't have the, the right kind of tenacity for that. Um, but it was, it was great. I got to see, uh, you know, Damien's love for the books, but I also got to see some of the, uh, the work that went into making comics, um, happen, even, even as a young kid. And so I, I fell in love with the process of creating uh, from, you know, sort of day one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to talk a little bit about like the development of vault, because one of the things that really stands out through all of your interviews is 
you are really pushing like the sci-fi fantasy thing. Like that is Vault's brand. That is the way that you were going. Now, when you were originally starting to kind of put together your lineup and you, what you wanted Vault to be, was that you, you mentioned sci-fi and fantasy being an interest even earlier in this conversation? But was that partially was that mostly because that was what interested you or is that partially because you viewed that as like a gap in the market in terms of where comics were it was a a bit of both actually uh i think that these genres have been i don't want to say underserved but not served in a focused way for a long time maybe maybe ever right and you know we look back at the history of publishing broadly construed comics construed specifically and you see two titanic organizations that entered the market with a genre focus Mm -hmm. Uh, and lots of other scattershot companies that that came along with scattershot catalogs and some of those are extraordinary scattershot catalogs but that's ultimately what they are um we wanted to offer uh, a genre focus because it helps sell books at every conceivable level. So, you know, I think a lot of folks think about buying books as a point of sale transaction only, but there's sort of three tiers above that. Um, You know, you're selling your distributor on a title, your distributor's selling the eventual bookseller, be that a comic shop or a, a traditional bookstore on the title. And then that bookstore is selling the end buyer on that title having a genre focus facilitates transactions at every level because it enables us to communicate very quickly what we have to offer and very quickly what people should expect when they buy from us. Um, In addition, I think, and I I don't want to speak for Adrian too much here, but it enables him to do his job uh, much better than a a sort of more expansive catalog might. Mm -hmm. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a very focused, very small catalog, um, especially considering the number of submissions and pitches that we've that we've received over the last few years. Um, being able to look at all of those and recognize this, the very specific subgenres of science fiction and fantasy that I want to see represented in in comics and the kind of voices that I'd love to see telling those stories means that the, the catalog can continue to stay focused and feels very, very balanced. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's easy or as Damien said, uh, with that focus to recognize this is a very quality book. This is a great submission, but this isn't the right submission for vault. And that happens all the time. And it's the hardest part of my job is, turning down loads of books that really deserve to be published somewhere. They just aren't the right balance into our catalog. And I think that that's something, well, I know that's something that Damien and I have talked about sort of ad nauseum um, from the first day. And we'll talk about it to the last day. And that is maintaining that very focused, very curated catalog where ideally, and of course, you know, it's, it's an ideal, but ideally a reader who picks up one vault title and loves it could afford to read everything we put out, um, in a year. It's not, they could afford the time and, you know, the financially, and obviously those are, those are big obstacles to clear and it's an ideal, but it's, it's worth striving for that somebody who picks up one book and loves it, uh, can, could reasonably read everything vault puts out in in a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also think that these are genres that, um, the sort of chaff among the grain, notwithstanding are uniquely positioned to take on hard hitting issues. Right. You can be moralizing with a straight face while writing science fiction or fantasy in a way it's extraordinarily hard to achieve when writing straight fiction. Um, and this is something that's actually of great interest to us. Uh, we, we're really engaged with stories that do have some sort of robust philosophical core. This is perhaps due to the fact that I'm a philosopher by training, 
but that that might just be a side effect. <laughs> <laughs> and I I don't want to go too deep down that rabbit hole, but uh, I mean that what Damien and I are talking about is part of um, sort of my personal. Uh, kind of path with stories and discovery of stories. I fell deeply in love with, you know, the kind of literary classics and the sort of highbrow snobby literature at a, at a fairly young age and did not read much in the way of science fiction or fantasy for a number of years and then found myself gravitating kind of back to sci-fi and fantasy by way of the comics I was reading. And I was seeing what the comics were doing in genre space. And it then, you know, made me want to explore what prose was doing in genre space. And Damien was, you know, putting great books in my hands and that always helped. Um, but I ended up sort of coming to this realization that most of the stories that affected me as a person that I carry with me all the time um, were genre stories and they were sci-fi and they were fantasy. And there was a way in which those genres were pushing closer to emotional truths, uh, than any realist quote unquote fiction, uh, ever did. Sure. Well, I, I think, I think it's a really interesting, I, I mean, cause you, you were talking earlier about how a lot of publishers kind of have scattershot lines and like, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but like some publishers, you know, as much as I enjoy a lot of their work, like I couldn't tell you what X, you know, a book by X company actually means. Like it, it's like a good comic maybe, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. And it seems like one of the core focuses for the two of you is finding the intersection between good comics that also fit the vault brand. Like it's like it kind of like an intersection of your two roles. Like it's like, you want to have something that's a good comic from your perspective, Adrian, but also for you, Damien, like something that works for your, like fits this, this view you guys have. And so I, I guess like, you know, two of the books that I've read in prep for this is, is, uh, is Heaven and, and Friendo, both of which are great books, very different books. Uh, one sci-fi, one other one's fantasy. What makes those two, like, what makes those fit the vault look of your brand versus, like, I don't know, any of the other submissions that you might have had to turn down or something? Um, yeah, uh, those are, t I mean, all of my titles are sort of obviously my favorites, but Heathen and Friendo are, like, you've, you've kind of picked the two that I always point to that I often point people to as like, here are the opposite ends of the sort of vault spectrum oh, yeah. and then imagine everything in between. Um, so it's, it's very cool that you, you landed on those. Um, I mean, Frendo is a uh, parable. I mean, Alex wears that uh, on, you know, as hard on his sleeve. It's a book about capitalism, a book about consumerism, a book about marketing. And it's, got teeth for days. I mean, it'll just, it tears you apart. It's scathing. And yet at the same time, I found personally in my own sort of interpretation, step aside from the editorial role, my own sort of interpretation as a reader, uh, kind of getting to read all the way through to the end, but well in advance of any, anyone else that what I walked away with was this sort of, uh, question where like, does it matter that Jerry is an AI? Is he not real? Is he not ultimately exactly what, you know, the, the Leo character right. <laughs> needed, which is a companion in a world where everyone was at arm's length and it's all voyeurism all the time. Here was somebody that actually spoke to him. And, you know, they, there's that great shot. I don't want to spoil anything for anybody who's <laughs> listening hasn't read it yet, but there's this great shot where the two characters sort of lie down together and almost become one. And that was incredibly moving. And likewise with Heathen, uh, you know, that book is a book that, uh, that really at the end of the day, it's entirely about love. Mm -hmm. there, you have, you have a quest, you have a Viking warrior, you have, you know, eventually trolls and mermaids and talking horses. Um, but it's a book that very simply is about love and it's that love is sort of infectious. And when you read it, you, despite how 
uh, awful some of the um, sort of moments in that story are to its characters, you feel this like just overwhelming sense of like warmth and love because you have a character who deeply cares about other people and is and is so compassionate that, like I said, it's infectious. And so I think the the common, uh, you know, sort of the commonality between these two in, in intensely different titles that, like I said, kind of represent the opposite ends of the vault spectrum um, is that they're they're very simply stories about humans uh, trying desperately to reach out and interact with other people and find ways to be compassionate. And I read them as an editor, but also as a reader, and I fell in love with it as a reader. And that's something that I know it can frustrate creators to hear that because it feels like a vague and almost sort of nebulous thing. Like, how do I you know, make, if I'm pitching or submitting to Adrian, how do I make him fall in love with the story? Uh, I can't put that, or I can't articulate that. If I could, then, you know, every, we'd sell a million copies on every book, right? But like, right. Uh, it's, it's that. If I can, if you can make me forget that I'm doing a job, and make me read as somebody who just desperately wants to turn that next page, then that's it. That's the book that needs to be told. And it almost always comes down to finding those, uh, those core human moments. The, as Faulkner said, the, you know, the human heart and conflict with itself. It's that, if you can put that in a Viking tale, if you can put that in a weird, crazy, su ultra violent, you know, like robbing spree, like Brendo, it doesn't matter if you if you land that note. It's what I was saying earlier about sci-fi and fantasy. You're pushing on these emotional truths in a way that I don't see uh, realist fiction doing it. Um, at least not as personally uh, affecting uh, for me as as sci-fi and fantasy do. Ultimately, these are also books that are um, really easy to market. Natasha uh, and her rare convention outings often just puts a sign on her table in front of copies of heathen that says a lesbian viking book <laughs> <laughs> it it sells itself right and friendo uh well i've never pitched it this way before you know could sort of easily be pitched as a as a book for anyone who loves their or rather who hates their iphone but can't put it away right right <laughs> yeah you know it's uh, it's it's cyberpunk for the iphone era um and and so they're they're very easy to sell through mm -hmm. and sell in, and so that's something that we think about a lot as well. Is this a book that we can create genuine market traction for? And between those two considerations, you know, we we end up with the catalog that we have, and uh, sometimes, you know, one set of considerations maybe leads us to be more flexible in with respect to the others. But at the end of the day, we're we're trying to make sure we're cultivating this catalog of excellent stories that are also commercially appealing. Right. Well, I mean, I, I was actually having this. I, I have a, I relaunched my comic site sketched a couple weeks ago, and as part of that, it has like a, a form element. And I was I was talking with a bunch of people today uh, about basically that broad, uh, you know, broad subject. It's like you know, you're trying to find. Like comic publishers are always trying to find the the happy middle ground between making something good but also making something that sells. And a lot of retailers I talk to talk about how, you know, a comic can be good, but it doesn't have an obvious market. And and that can be one of the tricky things is like trying to find something that won't just be good, but something that you can sell like in, in a quick pitch or something like, you know, you're talking about Natasha. It's like there aren't a lot of lesbian Viking tales like heathen out there and weirdly actually there i don't know if you ever read eternal by uh eric zawadzki and uh ryan k Lindsay, but that it like weirdly there's actually a couple viking shield maiden comics in the last couple of years that are outstanding heathen is one of them though but i i you know in terms of branding was the first of them <laughs> it, it, it was it was fire that flaming arrow out over the lake <laughs> <laughs> I am curious where Myriad, your middle grade and, and young adult imprint, fits within that brand, though, because it is, I mean, conceptually different. It's a different target market, I'm guessing, than what you were going for before. Where where does that fit in what you're trying to do at Vault? 
Um, yeah, so Myriad, our young adult middle grades and young reader imprint, is <clears throat> I think it's a really vital step forward for Vault. Um, obviously, Damien can talk to all the reasons uh, on the number side of that being the you know the grow the the, the fastest growing sort of market and all of that. But uh, I, I think that for us um, on sort of more my side, the <laughs> like it. It's a step forward for us because we can grow the most important and audience out there. We can bring in younger readers um, who honestly shouldn't probably be picking up most of our books right now. And we can get them excited about uh, comic books and hopefully start to kind of, I think, rewire some of the ways we talk about and uh, kind of like conceive of comics culturally and c continue to push it away from being like niche and other and toward just being um, a, a purely accepted form of literature the way it ought to be and the way it is by I think everybody who you know who does this professionally in one capacity or another and uh, Myriad will start very much with a, the genre focus that we've brought to the vault catalog, but it is our intention to um, expand beyond sci-fi and fantasy uh, for our younger readers in that Myriad um, line. And I mean, that's part and parcel of the name Myriad. We want to explore a number of different formats for publishing, um, OGNs, single issues, some uh, kind of hybrid stuff that we're really excited about. And we also want to um, grow and develop our uh, some some sort of some new genres and some new spaces. And yeah, it'd be great to age those readers up so that you know someday they're reading Vault and hopefully handing those myriad books to uh, their own kids. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, through no fault of of the medium, but to some degree. Uh, as a constraint of the direct market, there are certain kinds of stories that either, there's not much of a place to tell in books that are sold in comic shops. Now, this is changing. There are a lot of great stores out there that are um, working hard and successfully to sell books to younger readers. But we found ourselves regularly confronting these extraordinary submissions that we didn't have a place for, and we also felt like there wasn't a place for out there uh, among the publishers like HarperCollins or, or Graphics because they were coming to us from creators who were historically comics writers or comics artists. And, you know, there just hasn't been a lot of conversance or talent sharing between the big pros publishers and the comics publishers historically. Some of this, I think, maybe is protectionist on comics publishers' parts, but some of this is also that a lot of uh, comics creators don't have access to the kind of representatives or contact networks that, you know, they could leverage to get deals with somebody like HarperCollins. And so we saw all these extraordinary stories out there, and we, we wanted to create a place for them in much the same way we sought to create a place for them with Vault initially. So on the one hand, you could say, look, yeah, these are two entirely distinct um, markets, and they are, but they, they are markets we, uh, on the other hand, thought we could achieve a beachhead in both of with the same strategy. Mm -hmm. Are you looking at Myriad as still direct market focused, or is this going to shift more towards the book market than, than Vault is? So Myriad um, will certainly have a lot going to target the direct market. We love the direct market retailers we get to work with and Vault would be nothing without their steadfast support. Um, you know, some of them uh, read our books more attentively than I do and love them <laughs> than, than I do, you know, and, and like these, these retailers are some of my favorite people in the world. Um, but we certainly think of Myriad as having a potential to get up and run in the book market. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure that it does. Because at the end of the day, that's not only good for Myriad and good for Vault, but good for the direct market. 
and I'll, you know, argue with certain partisans of different views until uh, we both pass out from exhaustion. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I think it's 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 all very complimentary, or at least it should be. But I mean, the, the interesting thing is is, and I'm I'm sure uh, you've probably read uh, Brian Hibbs's uh, book scan numbers for this year. I don't know if you read that on the beat, where he goes through all the book scan numbers to see what performed well in the book uh, the book market. But I thought one of the really interesting things about that report was how little overlap there was between like the two markets and like that's I mean it is kind of interesting that there is such a distinction between those two markets considering they're the same art form they're like theoretically like could be the same audiences but there's just really a big divide there and I guess that's one of the main reasons why it's sort of a large it's a large numbers problem right like we shouldn't be surprised to discover that elements exist in different ratios on earth than they do in the universe at large because the orders of magnitude are are so different uh, from one you know, one level of analysis to the other. Sure. Uh, you know, in the book market, we're talking about titles that have the space to sell in millions of copies, like perhaps they once did in the, well, they, they definitely once did in the direct market, but we don't have a direct market that supports titles selling on that scale yet, uh, or rather any longer. Hopefully we'll get back to that at some point. Um, but, you know, as a result, like I don't find the lack of overlap remotely surprising. Um, I also think that publishers like us and, you know, at least one of the big two are taking steps to see that that uh, Venn diagram has more in the middle um, by working to grow a younger readership than they previously saw it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, uh, I liked your usage of one of the two. I know which one you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> I actually, I want to actually go over a quote that I read in another interview uh, that you said, Adrian, and it was it was a line that you said where um, you said the part that Damien left out was that while we love making comics, we were not as fond of some of the practices in the industry. Vault was and always will be our chance to treat creators, fans, retailers, comics in their totality well. I, I, you know, related to all the stuff we're talking about and how you view comics and view the larger industry and your approach, like, what does that mean to you? Like, when when you say something like that? Uh, well, I can say specifically that you know, Damien and I started uh, self publishing and um, you know, pushing some of our own books, and we both worked uh, kind of every step of the way. Damien lettered and designed. I wrote scripts. I, you know even helped like thumb sequences uh, when we were working with uh, our cousin Nathan, who was illustrating. And we found ourselves in a really interesting position where um, we could sort of, we had enough traction with one of our books, The Gifted, uh, at the time to um, potentially start taking it to publishers. And we even got approached by a number of publishers and we kind of got to see behind uh, the curtain. And we were also selling enough of the book on like the convention, you know, sort of tour going around that we weren't in a position where we had to say yes. And there, there was a, um, there were a number of, uh, a number of practices that really made us um uncomfortable and whether that was um contractual things or more specifically just uh the sort of treatment of stories themselves for me there was a um kind of disconnect between uh product and story when there ha there absolutely has to be a marriage you have to if you're in the like a professional role as an editor or a publisher you have to see them see a comic book, any book as both. It is both product and it is both and story. And there was just a sort of felt um, view of our work as just as just product. Mm. Um, and that was deeply frustrating. And we wanted to create a, a space in which um, creators were actually partnered with a publisher who got to do who had to do the work of being the publisher and treating it like a product and giving them the space to treat it like a store, giving the creators the space to treat it like a story 
and then, you know, likewise sort of reciprocating and helping kind of teach creators as well how to uh, respect their stories as products and make sure that editorially those stories, uh, you know, were being respected. And so that that was one of those first kind of learning experiences for us when we were uh, kind of young and very young and fortunate enough to be in a position where we didn't have to say yes to, to publishing that we recognized like, hey, you know, we could negotiate our own diamond deal and we could figure out how to do this and we could build the infrastructure and then sort of lo and behold, we did. And we recognized we had all the tools to to publish other work and um, do our our best to create that exact environment we hadn't found because I, 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 I respect the hell out of um, image and the image deal and the way that that has helped break so many barriers in comics. But I also have watched too many of my friends just sort of, um, and too many creators that I adore kind of get put through that grinder of having to uh, put respecting and treating their story as story on hold for sake of doing a lot of the publishing work. And that's just one small example. Um, yeah, I think um, for a long time, comics creators have sort of faced a choice between being fully supported to work on someone else's thing mm. or being minimally supported to work on their own thing. And there are a few publishers out there like us who thought, what if we supported them fully to work on their own thing? Perhaps we'd get some really extraordinary <laughs> Lo and behold, we have. <laughs> Yo, everybody. I want to take a second to talk about my friends at TKO Studios. TKO Studios is a new comic publisher that launched with what the New York Times calls an impressive slate of talent. They publish books by top creators, including Roxanne Gay, Jeff Lemire, Garth Ennis, Gabriel Walta, and many more. TKO also does things differently than other publishers. They binge release their books and offer each title in whatever format you most enjoy reading your comics in. Whether that's a six issue set in a collector's box, trade paperback, or digital download. I'm a single issues guy, so I went that route and I love the collector's box. Even better, all of TKO's first issues are free to read at tkopresents.com right now. So if you're curious, visit tkopresents.com to give them a try or follow at TKO Presents across all social platforms. And if you're a store that's interested in stocking TKO's books, email retailers at tkopresents.com to learn more about one of the best retailer deals in the industry. And now, back to the show. I mean, I've talked to to Eric Stevenson at Image uh, a number of times, and one of the things I remember him saying was something like, you know, I Image isn't for everyone because, like, that's a skill set that not everybody has, like the production side and, and, you know, doing the marketing yourself and doing all that because there's, like, a job on top of the job of making comics. And so that is, that is a nice middle ground to exist in. I, I guess that makes me wonder, though, like – relative i mean I, i'm sure you can't get into too many details but relative to if, if if you're kind of a middle ground in between image and doing for hire work what does your deal look like is, is it a creator-owned deal uh our our deal is a creator-owned deal beyond that i'm not going to speak to specific in general interview. sure yeah no i totally understand I, I did want to ask a question uh, that I got actually from one of my patrons uh, who is a retailer. He, he, you know, I do want to give you a compliment. He said specifically, he said that you all are doing a whole lot of things right working with retailers, which, and he really appreciated it. But he was curious about your view of, you know, monthlies versus trades and like, what's the strategy with that and why? Like, I'm going to use an example, like... Uh, Heathen, as as I said, is is a great book, but it's also a book that has you know Natasha had health problems with her hand and everything like that. It's fallen a bit off schedule because of that. Now she's working with Ashley Woods, I believe it is, as the artist. Had like you know with those like, did you ever consider like flexing something like Heathen to become like a graphic novel centric book centric book instead of being a single issue book? Uh, yes, we have, and um, we actually. Uh have interacted with a number of retailers about that title specifically and others 
um, where we were kind of, you know, learning the ropes and running into some delays that we've, you know, since sort of better prepared for as we admittedly learned those lessons. And um, the consensus largely was from from direct market retailers, was please do not shift uh, your single issue um, comics over to now just releasing in graphic novel trades because we've built an audience uh, who cares about the book and expect it in this format and are willing to wait because they love the story. And so through that feedback, you know, we've had a, numerous conversations in the office about it. Um, through that feedback, we've ultimately chosen to stay with the single issue comics and, of course, put together the trades and lean into the trades when the time comes, but um, kind of honor the promise that we we made uh, in the first place with the single issues. Uh, we've we've gone to trades to finish um, books before, and uh, we've we've learned that readers if if a reader commits to a story, they care that the publisher sort of doesn't sort of does reciprocate and um, commits to seeing it out in that in that format and in in the single issues. So uh, that's ultimately been um, an ongoing conversation, but we we feel like we've had pretty strong consensus that that's the right call to make. Yeah, I actually think one of the interesting things about the, the monthly format, like the issue format is to a certain degree, it's kind of like in Seinfeld. I hate to make a Seinfeld reference, but it relates to everything. <laughs> but like that episode where George, uh, like, you know, starts dropping his name, like he wants to leave something behind because it's like the by men in commercials. And it's like, you always remember it. I feel like, com like to a certain degree, like single issues, it's like having that regularity keeps you connected to the book. And then when you get to the trade, that'll speak to a different audience. But if you lose those single issues, it's like, I've had, there's like series that I've read where I'll be buying it in single issues and then it switches to a trade format and I actually forget about it be yep. because I don't have that like regularity anymore. It's just like that it's, it's like in a weird way that book kind of evaporates from my brain and like maybe that's a personal problem, but at the same time, it's still a problem no less. It's still a problem. And I, you know, I can think of like the sort of the, the opposite, right? Like those ongoing books that you, you can kind of like measure your, history and individuality and like kind of growth as a person with issues like wicked and divine that has been a, a series that i've you know i've been reading since day one i have my number one that i picked up you know that i that i pre-ordered and i went to the shop and i got it and i mean i remember then like arguing with friends saying like you have to read this book you have to read this book they're building something grand and that that book releasing and yeah, there have been, you know, changes in release schedules and whatever. It doesn't matter because you, like you said, you know, it's there. It's this monthly thing. And there's something really just so satisfying about staying with a comic book uh, from issue number one to, you know, issue number whatever and feeling like you got to be there uh, with that growth and sort of measure who you were and where you were when you sat down and read any single issue. Um, that's like a, it's a very powerful thing and it's a, a thing that feels pretty fairly unique to comics. Um, I think it's part of the magic of comics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I'm not going to prognosticate about the future of comics as a periodical medium, but vault still has a lot of room to grow as a publisher of periodicals. And so we're enthusiastically committed to that format uh, while also making, you know, serious efforts in other formats. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to give you guys a serious feather in your cap. This is like some deep nerd talk, but I have to say your books smell amazing. And <laughs> <laughs> I actually tweeted that. I was just like my, my first like review of Vault Comics. So I was like, man, these comics smell good. And I, I, I that's there's. I, I have a lot of respect for companies who put some work in on the production side of things, like the design and paper stock on all of your books is great. And and that makes a difference because it makes sure that I want to keep buying this because it's it's like it's worth it from a physical relic standpoint, because it's like everything that you choose to have in your home is like 
taking up precious physical space. And it's like if, if if a book is not made well and if a book is just like has bad paper quality, it's going to kind of turn you off. And also when you're reading it and it smells good, that's like, you know, a nice effect. So good job by you guys. <laughs> that, that That's a huge feather in your cap, at least for this reader. Well, thank, <laughs> well, thank you. you. I, uh, all thanks uh, there should be passed along to the wonderful printers with, with whom we get to work. Yeah, the the, the printers and uh, Tim Daniel, who does all of uh, the design on uh, all of our books, and Damien's being modest, but also Damien himself. I, I can take no credit for that, but between Damien and Tim, they make sure that uh, <laughs> every one of our books is... Yeah, like you said, it's like it's palpable. It's like a tactile experience, and it should – you just spent money on it. It should feel nice to pick it up and open it up, and if it smells yeah. good, that's great. <laughs> As a leader, I, I admire the innovations that have been made in digital delivery of books, um, but I, I, I'm disinterested in the experience of reading digitally. You know, like the, the Codex was this great leap forward in information technology and, you know, smartphones are barely its equal. You know, like you can stick your finger in a book and page back and forth between <laughs> two pages instantaneously and you still can't do that with anything Yeah, uh, that's not a Codex. And ultimately, you know, a Saddle Stitch comic is just a tiny little Codex. I love the experience of, you know, feeling them in my hand when I, I read I don't remember things I don't read when I uh, uh, physically. So for me, I remain, you know, deeply committed uh, personally and, and, you know, economically in <laughs> making high quality physical books, whether they are saddle stitch comics or trade paperback graphic novels or hardcover graphic novels. That is an interesting position, though, because it's like I feel like a lot of publishers because there is prohibitive cost to going with a better paper quality and there is prohibitive cost to making a better looking book. You know, a lot of times when you're a new publisher, it's like sometimes you'll pass on those things because it's it's like a corner you can cut. Why, why was that something that was essential to making fault what it was in your mind? Well, I mean, first of all, we wanted our readers to feel like they were being respected and taken seriously by the brand. Sure. And one way to do that is to give them a good product. Um, second, and you know, this, this may be, if not a shot across anyone's bow, <laughs> a flag planted in the ground. <laughs> we were never particularly interested in succeeding in this industry on a small scale. Um, so for us, we knew that it was going to be a long road. Um, and that we were going to have to put up some serious year over year growth numbers to achieve our goals so far we have. And so, uh, the small end of the margins wasn't a, a concern for us. We were always looking forward to, uh, an area in which the revenue pool might get a bit deeper. So it was kind of like an investment in your future. Basically it's like, if, if you want to make a, a, brand that seems like or you know if you want to make books that people can get invested in you have to invest in at in the, the front basically yeah if you want to take a beachhead you don't do it with inflatable boats <laughs> <laughs> i i do love that you're working with tim tim's a great guy uh i knew him quite a, uh, quite well back when i used to be one of the main people who ran multiversity comics and i do love that you kind of have your little missoula family like missoula seems like it's very much uh, a, an essential part of what Vault is all about. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would say so. Um, I mean, Tim and I met at a signing at Hastings in Missoula when Hastings was still a thing, and um, just became friends because it is a small community. And you know, I've, I've, I was talking about this before, but uh, Missoula tries really hard to be to to always put on events. And to kind of give everyone in this little town uh, something to do. And we were at one of those events. And it was really cool to, you know, get to sit down face to face with somebody else who was making comics, um, despite all the hurdles that come with making comics. And that's kind of been uh, the, the sort of magic of working in Missoula every step of the way is that we found really, really great people. Um, they gravitate toward us. They end up in Missoula for a reason. And we, yeah, we've created a nice little community here. Um, and like we have, a, you know, at our little local shop, we have our own rack of just vault comics. Nice. And people come in all the time and 
are not, you know, diehard comic readers. They pick up a couple issues every few months and they see like, oh, made in Missoula, Montana. And they're, they're like, wait, people make comic books here? That's amazing. And then they buy a ton of the books. And um, building that community has been really uh, fulfilling. It, if we were based in, I don't know, New York or California, it'd be a whole lot harder um, to create that space, I think. But uh, here at this stage in our in Vault's life, um, Missoula has been really, really good to us. And it does kind of, yeah, like you said, it's this little, it's this little family. Tim and I have been friends um, for a long time now, and it's been really nice to kind of grow from just Tim and I being friends, hanging out, making comic books in Missoula to, you know, having an office where people come and stop by because they read our books and they know they can come and stop by and talk to us and like see the books being made and being like, Oh, that's so cool. This, when does this book come out? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it also helps that man, that guy is one hell of a designer. It, when I, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I put a post up on my forum asking people for uh, what their thoughts were on vault. And like almost every single person was like, the design is amazing. Oh my God. <laughs> so, yeah. That's uh, working with Tim is like, it's like magic. He's, you know, he catches lightning in a bottle every damn time. <laughs> well, one of the other questions they asked, or one of my, uh, the people in that, that thread asked was uh, he applauded you for the fact that you have, you're one of the rare publishers that has drm free backups of all your books on comiXology why was that something you wanted to do because it is uh it is atypical for us we had made the books available drm free through other uh other sales channels that you know we didn't get a lot of traction with but i wanted to be consistent uh across sales channels and i also um don't trust the vicissitudes of giant corporations <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I've been, I've just been, you know, disconsolate when Amazon has taken things out of my video library never to return uh, and then offered me, you know, a $5 Amazon credit to make up for it. And I never wanted to do that yeah. <laughs> to our readership. On top of which, um, it's not as though making, putting DRM protection on our comiXology titles is even the thinnest shield against piracy. So it just sort of seemed like a silly formality for no real reason. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, honestly, that that's, it is kind of staggering those piracy sites, how quickly they get stuff up. But at the same time, like there are a lot of people that are just like you from a consumer standpoint. I mean, it's like the, the, the person who asked that question specifically said that, you know, he buys comics. He won't buy comics digitally, effectively that he can't get drm free backups because like what happens if it all goes away one day the very same thing you were saying i mean it's it's it is interesting i i don't i don't honestly know why a lot of people don't or a lot of publishers don't do drm free but of course i don't run a publisher so i can't really speak to it but it... <laughs> i mean my suspicion is that you know someone and their it consulting side tells them that this is a protection against piracy and it just simply isn't right you know if if comiXology thinks that their drm hasn't been cracked and recracked every time they update it within <laughs> and the they, they put it live they're just like selling themselves the most ludicrous of fictions yeah um well i i want to talk about the creators you work with but before i jump into that i do want to bring up something i mentioned i was going to bring up and that was uh you know I don't remember if it was, I think it was like late last year, there was a concern about creator payments and some of the pay, uh, creators not being, you know, paid on time. And it was something that you made a statement on Bleeding Cool, specifically about what happened, and everything like that. I don't want to ask specifically about that because you've already addressed that. But I do want to ask, and this is related to something a patron of mine was asking, you know, you're new to this, you're, you're figuring all this out. Your, the payment thing is is part and parcel with that. What mistakes do you feel you've made along the way, and how do you how did you address things like the payment issue and learn from them in the process? Yeah, so one of the great challenges any startup faces is trying to look ahead to see what infrastructure it's going to need for challenges that it can't predict. Um. And also trying to look ahead for the infrastructure it's going to need for challenges that it can predict, right? And obviously, um, there are actually some things you can do 
to put you know infrastructure in place for challenges that you can't predict. And the biggest thing you can do there is to make sure that you have really good communication systems in place internally and externally. And so uh, for us, that was a limiting factor in addressing some of the issues that you've raised. So we've made a lot of efforts to overhaul our communication practices and to make sure that for you know any critical issue, um, you know there's one point of contact within the company who can can handle that and appropriately engage other people as needed. Um, in in general, we benefit from a somewhat. Um, we're some, we benefit and are occasionally hindered from a somewhat uh, unorthodox corporate arrangement. Um, our original investors are themselves, you know, business people with a wide variety of businesses, and so uh, our a lot of our traditional business services are provided by a subsidiary company that they have that that largely does that. And sometimes, just sort of ironing out the kinks between. Our, our core organization and this partner organization that we work with for those things has, has been its own unusual set of difficulties. Um, generally speaking, though, you know, I, I think that uh, I, I'm reluctant to say that we've made mistakes in the sense of having done things that I regret and totally willing to say that we've made mistakes in having stepped in holes we didn't foresee. Sure. Right. And, uh, you know, one of those was, was, you know, more careful, uh, communication management surrounding payment and more careful cash flow management. And we've taken, you know, sweeping steps to make sure that both of those problems are, resolved and every creator that we work with is, you know, current and, all payments. Um, you know, that's, that's a, something we're really proud of making sure we, we made our way back to as rapidly as we could. Uh, I think we've also, you know, implemented sales initiatives that we cooked up as harebrained schemes that turned out to find no traction at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've we've had a lot of these sort of one-off ideas that strike us as inspired and maybe someone with, uh, a more, a more seasoned hand in, in the comic space would have said, yeah, that's probably not going to work. But I think for every one, you know, idea that turned out to be a harebrained, we, we've had, you know, a, another that turned out to find traction that we weren't seeing, you know, other publishers implement. So uh, I, you know, relentlessly proud of the team that I work with and the work that they've done and always willing to learn from the experience we have along the way. Yeah, and I would just add to that it to, that it's a uh, it's a testament to um, the incredible creators that we work with. That uh, you know, I feel like our professional relationships and our friendships have only sort of been galvanized. <laughs> like it's it's this uh, really incredibly encouraging um, moment and vault to life right now where. Um, you know, some of those creators have been with us from day one, have watched and, you know, even stepped in those holes <laughs> with us, yeah. uh, like watched us step in those holes and, 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 uh, and some of them have been there right, you know, right with us kind of every step of the way and have, as I said, like main, not just maintained, but developed an even closer and, and, and stronger professional relationship with those creators, um, precisely because, uh, you know, we, we did our damn best to, to listen and, and, you know, make sure that we did improve our communications and take all the steps that Damien was, you know, you just sort of walking through. And, uh, like I said, it's just been, it's been a very encouraging, uh, like really encouraging moment for us. And I feel like we're at this, this, this wonderful moment in Vault's life where like all of those people, all of those creators, um, are now, uh, you know, we're working to lift each other up every step of the way and recognizing that we did learn, um, from those, you know, from those missteps. Yeah, I think one of the tricky things that can happen in comics is when when the thing, you know, the types of things that you guys were dealing with, 
when those happen, what can often happen is the conversations start happening, you know, like at cons and start happening at like, you know, DM threads and like Twitter and stuff like that. And next thing you know, that like people start getting reputation and everything like that. And I will say to your credit, um, a lot of publishers, when faced with your situation, don't actually go out in public and say anything. They're just like, whatever, we'll just hire somebody else. And you guys actually went out and made a statement, which I think makes a big difference because I think at a certain point it becomes, you know, you talked about how communication was key. It's like you have to relay to your creators that this is a resolved problem because it, it can make a big difference in, I'm sure, that the talent who's interested in working with you, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, like uh, c- creators have, you know, every reason in this industry with its history to be uh, tentative and to be downright scared. Um, and that is that can create a sort of reactionary space like you were talking about, but rightfully so. And so it's been, I think, part and parcel of why it's been so encouraging is that, um, you know, we did speak out of, about it and we took a stand and we resolved it and we resolved it with, you know, everyone across the board. And that, um, that m- created a space where, uh, those creators were like, Hey, you know, for, for lack of a better way to say it, they're like, we stood by them and they stood by us. And now like anybody who asks, that's what I'll tell them. And it's been, um, yeah, it's been great. It's meant that, uh, yeah, like, you know, we we had some missteps, but I don't think it's in any way negatively impact my rela- impacted my relationship with any creators or prospective creators. Um, all I've really heard is uh, like a real, just an incredible positivity around um, the fact that we've, we've managed to push through and uh, grow and grow in sales numbers and audience and and how we communicate and uh how we run you know run this ship yeah Uh, i do want to ask just really quick about some of your creators because i i I for one am extremely uh i i find the white noise crew to be very exciting uh ryan o'sullivan rom v uh alex packnadel and uh i i apologize if i didn't pronounce your name right alex and uh dan waters I mean, like that's that's an amazing quartet, and it kind of feels like it. They're a great fit for generally who you work with and kind of who you look for, because I feel like there's a lot of really talented creators out there who aren't really getting opportunities because they're in this like nebulous gray area between being a completely new creator and being somebody who's really established, and. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I'm curious, like in, in relation to White Noise and all the other, uh, you know, creators you work with, what what do you look for? Do you look for creators to work with or do you look for works to work with, if that makes any sense? Oh, no, that makes perfect sense. And the answer is uh, definitely both. And there's nothing that makes me want to work with a creator faster than finding a work, <laughs> a work that I go, ah, I'm. I'm just jealous. I wish that I had been able to publish this book. Um, And I can say for every one of the white noise guys, uh, Alex Rom, uh, Dan Ryan, all of them had published stories previously that I thought these, each one of these could represent uh, vault brilliantly. Clearly they're capable and desire and they desire to tell stories um that will only uh boost vault up and they need a space um they're not getting the chances that they they deserve uh to tell those stories and so i i love receiving submissions from um newer creators or downright new creators we have a number of debut uh, creators this year. I mean, she said destroyed just came out today Liana, and yeah. And well, exactly. And Liana and Joe, they've, they've done work on anthologies. They've done incredible work. They've shown that they have everything it takes to launch a fantastic story to great success. Um, but they hadn't been given that opportunity yet with a series all to themselves and a series that isn't, you know, entirely their own. And so that's a great example of seeing like the kind of promise 
of those creators and seeing that they're working no matter who's telling them no. They're not taking no for an answer and they're working despite that. And that tenacity is absolutely something I seek out. Um, and it has to be married with the right story. So I'll approach those creators. And if they have a story that they're aching to tell, then that can be, you know, the sort of perfect storm and, and, and a book comes to life at Vault. But then, yeah, the white noise guys represent, I think, kind of like a, a step sort of further along and maybe like a creator's kind of career where they've they've put excellent books out. And I'm baffled that they're not that every editor out there isn't like, you know, champing at the bit to work with those guys. Um, and so when I see that there's, <laughs> you know, where I, I think other editors are snoozing. Yeah, I'm going to jump in and offer them, you know, work and the chance to tell whatever whatever crazy story they they want to tell. Because ultimately, I think the thing that has been <clears throat> just the the most beneficial for my relationship with creators and hopefully creators relationship with me is that they read vault books all the time. Like they're reading vault books. Every creator I talk to is reading almost every title we put out. And that means they know the kind of stories we tell here intimately and are thinking constantly, like what sort of space could I conquer at vault that nobody else has touched? And, uh, that's been, that's been really, um, really wonderful for me. And I get to have these conversations with like, I, you know, I, I reach out to, uh, some of, you know, some creators and immediately they, they say like, Oh, I've already, I've read these six books by you guys. And I know that I want to tell a story just like this because it feels like it has a home at vault and I haven't seen you do it yet. And there's a part of me that just like gets to sit back and go like, well, you're kind of doing the hardest part of my job. <laughs> like, you know, you're doing the hardest part right there. You are inspired by the stories that, that we are already telling and they're inspiring you to tell more stories. And there's nothing that's more fulfilling than that as an editor. So do you feel like, I mean, as far as pitches are concerned to a certain degree, it's like, you're almost looking for spaces that are unfilled in, in your current lineup that kind of fit the, the vault feeling what, like the idea of what a vault yep. book is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, I think to your point earlier, uh, there, there is a sort of sense and a feel of, um, to a vault book from the tactile experience to the stories we tell those kind of common threads that can unite a books as different as heathen and friendo and uh creators are typically phenomenal readers so they feel that and and they um they come kind of prepared with stories that they want to plug into that space and uh so yes absolutely when i'm looking um through and submissions i have gaps in my like little niches and and spaces that I want to see filled. I have subgenres. Like for a while, there was, you know, there was a very specific uh, sort of end of the world bio terror kind of space that I wanted to fill. And then Dan was like, "Well, I have this book, Deep Roots, and it <laughs> checks all of those boxes." And I was like, "Oh, well, perfect." And that's a, it's a communication. Like once I reach out to a creator or they reach out to me, I really like to have a conversation and a dialogue. I am not an editor that wants six completed pages all the way down to letters to show me that you can do it every step of the way. I want to have a conversation where they feel they're, they're safe to throw ideas around and shape and mold something that they know is going to, uh, really come to life at vault and not just kind of feel like it falls by the wayside because it doesn't really capture the same um the same feel that the rest of our books do so how does how does somebody like gary doberman fit in there like he's like the screenwriter of it and he's co-writing mall for you like how does somebody like that become somebody who writes for vault i guess uh gary is a great friend of two uh creators that we have worked with in um the past and are working with in the future and so he he came by our 
uh, booth, I think the very first year we announced and picked up some of our like preview stuff. And I don't even think I really knew who Gary was at that point. And I, Gary's profile certainly wasn't as large, but he started reading and we again developed that uh, conversation, created a conversation, created a dialogue that lasted years um, where he would even send me bits and pieces of scripts um, or whole scripts from stuff that he was working on in the film and TV space, just to send it to me just to read. And, you know, all the while he was reading our comics and telling me how much he loves certain series and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And sure enough, he, uh, he and Mike Morisi, uh, created a, re- you know, developed like a really great friendship and, uh, Gary had this idea and he's a huge wasted space fan. And he was like, well, I would, ra- there's no one I'd rather partner with than Mike and you and make this book. Uh, you know, this comics is something I love, but I want to partner with somebody like Mike, who's writing one of my favorite books, Wasted Space, and do this thing right. So that's that's the very specific example of of Gary. And I think that you, you can just kind of extrapolate. That's how all of these people sort of end up um, kind of bumping into our catalog. It's it's. I'm sure it makes Damien happy when we have a name like <laughs> Gary, you know, attached to a book. Um, and maybe I could have forced that sooner uh but that's not um that's not how i think the the right stories come uh together and actually concretize and the way they come together and and actually take shape is through those conversations in all of this is a fair bit of me serving as a carnival barker for adrian's editorial (laughs) Well, I I do want to say, I, I'm guessing it makes your life a little bit easier, too, that Maul has to have one of the easiest pitches in the world to sell. Uh, I've been calling it Dawn of the Dead meets Lazarus, which I feel like is pretty on point. But like that, I don't know, that that book, when it was announced, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. That that makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very easy book to pitch. And uh, Zach uh, Hartong's um, line work on that book is unreal. His sequentials are so good uh that dude has such an eye for storytelling like it's one thing to be an incredible artist and it's another to just have that like just that like spark to be able to tell to freeze a moment every moment precisely at the right moment and that's that's what zach's done and it's been like a joy every step of the way to see his art come to life on that book um, panels that will crack you up and then also make you go like, oh man, that's badass in this crazy weird, you know, mall book that you just pitched perfectly. <laughs> I, I just have a few more questions. I, I, I did want to ask, um, about something involving Mike Morisi, uh, who is a hell of a nice guy. Like, I, I just want to say Mike's just a, a great guy, but, and you guys just signed an exclusive deal with him. Part of that exclusive deal was really fascinating to me because, let me get, let me see if I get this right. Uh, Wasted Space is being turned into an audio drama that he's helping put together. How how does that become a space that you that Vault is interested in? Because I mean, I, I guess Marvel did Wolverine: The Long Night. I think it was what it was called. So like, there is like established world where comic companies do things like this, but it is a bit atypical. Why was that something you wanted to do? So for us making inroads into the audio space has long been a really important part of our multimedia strategy. And for every publisher that publishes comics and isn't foolish, multimedia is an important part of their long run business strategy. Um, I say, you know, publishers have to be foolish to overlook this because ultimately, uh, you know, giant faceless megacorps are going to keep coming, buying comic books and making billions of dollars with them. People who publish comic books should maybe get a share of that money too, right? So that, that's why it's an important component of our strategy, broadly construed. Audio has been an important component of our strategy um, from, from the outset. It's sort of a curious uh, coincidence of timing that, you know, podcasts are exploding right now. There was no predicting that when we built a roadmap for this business a few years ago. Um, But audiobooks are, in general, uh, a really excellent way for people to experience content, Mm -hmm. right? For us, they're a cost-effective way to give 
fans of vault titles new ways to experience the stories and story worlds that they love. So this is why we, we sort of sought out audio and it's a place where we can, as you know, now and as time goes by, uh, exert more control over the multimedia expansion of the brand than we might in costlier areas like uh, television or film. Yeah. And I'll say that, uh, you know, Mike's stories are the perfect place to start because Mike has, especially in the last two years, cultivated such a voice. Um, and, you know, like his uh, his his book, Black Star Renegades, was nominated, um, it, you know, nearly won like uh, audiobook of the year and was it's a great audiobook precisely because Mike writes with such strong voice and wasted space is a comic that is like, it's, it's kind of like two, two key ingredients. It's Hayden's crazy texture on the art and Mike's crazy voices and marry those together. And you have, you know, like this in, insanely stunning comic and it's a perfect blueprint for audio because you know, they can use Hayden's crazy worlds to create really fun environments with 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 audio. And then you have Mike's voice uh, as a as a as a writer to fall back on. Um, and that's so that was like the perfect place to start. And, I, you know, I'm ex excited to expand because I think we have a number of other um, creators who immediately come to mind. Uh, that and that are creating that same kind of perfect cocktail. Like uh, immediately, you know, we've already talked about them. Like Rom, Rom's books have such incredible voice to them, and I can it, I can hear them working as an audio story. I'm also obsessed with podcasts and audiobooks. Um, I can hear it working in that space because you you feel that voice um, in his stories immediately. They linger with you even after you like close that last page. Yeah. Well, I, and I think it's pretty interesting, too, because, like, these types of things could, in theory, like, kind of work backwards to your comics. It's like, if you if you like Wasted Space, the audio drama, then you'd probably appreciate it even more if you had Hayden Hayden's art, because... Right. I, I mean, honestly, like, I, I guess that was the weirdest part for me as, as when I first looked at that. I was like, that's kind of fun. But at the same time, it's like, it's interesting to think about a comic story without the kind of essential ingredient that makes it a comic, the art. But, you know, I, I hadn't thought of, like, the the sound design being kind of the equiv equivalent of that in terms of the audio drama world. But um, I, I, that this this ties into the final thing I want to talk about. And that's that's, you know, getting an audience, because I, I'm going to be honest, like I I read a lot of comics. I'm probably upper echelon in terms of the amount of comics I read. I have a podcast. I have a site. I mean, like, it's it's a big part of my life. It took me a long time to start reading Vault, if I'm being totally honest. Uh, and that can, you know, being a new publisher and like the blindness that can come with that can take a bit to overcome with, with readers and retailers. So, you know, so trying to get a foothold with not just comic shops, but comic readers, what did you do to get the word out about a vault? Because that, that can be the biggest struggle. Like how do you keep trying to build and connect with not just shops and bookstores and things like that, but readers who can become your evangelists, I guess. Well, it's a constant um, three-headed beast to battle, <laughs> right? So um, first, we have to make sure that we're giving Diamond all of the tools that we can um, to make the most of our catalog. And we have to make sure that uh, we're holding them accountable in the course of doing what is ultimately a really hard, really complicated job. Like I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of diamond bashing that happens, uh, in, you know, darker corners of comics conversation. Um, they, they have a really hard job. So we have to do everything we can to make sure that they get to do their job. Well, right. And that's a, that's a, been a, a big learning experience for us no doubt, but I think we've brought to bear a certain level of organization and data-driven practice that's impressed certain players there and made it a lot easier for us to, to work with them. So, for example, we, uh, you know, I, I don't know if this is an official record, but the good folks at Diamond tell me we're the 
youngest publisher ever to make it onto FOC. And we managed to do that by, you know, laying out some metrics we wanted to achieve and then achieving them and presenting a really data driven argument to Diamond that, you know, both parties were leaving money on the table by us not being on FOC. And we, you know, since we've moved to their FOC program, we've seen explosive sales growth. You know, so that's like one head of the beast. Then the other head of the beast is, of course, the, the one that you mentioned uh, a moment ago, and that's interfacing successfully with retail accounts. And uh, comics are unique, uh, almost entirely unique among retail channels other than food service in that people who buy comics uh, buy them from thousands of accounts owned by distinct individual business people, right? And this is, on the one hand, uh, from an outside perspective, nearly an insurmountable challenge, right? But from an insider's perspective, it's a great luxury because it means that at every one of these retail accounts, there's a uh, actual human being empowered to make decisions about stocking your catalog. And so each sale uh, of Vault into a new store can be achieved with the kind of, you know, old school elbow grease that's worked in sales forever. In a way that um, much as I love the buyers who represent the major book market chains, you can't get the same effects there, right? They are beholden to other decision makers um, and the guy who manages your local comic shop probably isn't. Um, so there, what we've focused on is uh, trying to be, if not best in class, then on par with the best in class. If you ask retailers, there's a definitive best in class for retail outreach practices. Um, we try to be on par with the best in class vendors there in our retailer relationships and to offer them uh all of the tools they need to successfully market and sell our books and plenty of, of de-risking, uh, you know, mechanisms like returnability to make it easier to get our books in the store and on the shelf. And then of course the, uh, the third head of the beast is the, the end consumer. And, you know, we have to do whatever we can to drive sell through. Right. But from the outset, from the inception of vault, uh, we've long thought that, Great story is the best sales tool for the end user. Uh, good books, if they don't sell themselves, they certainly do a lot better job selling themselves than bad books. And so we <laughs> thought to make sure that every book on the shelf was good and that every book in the catalog could be cross-sold with another book in the catalog, at least one, and in some cases, uh, several others. And then we do whatever we can to communicate to you know, the, the end purchaser of our comics, that this is an experience they can have if only they'd shell out three ninety nine plus tax on a vault book. And uh, I think I'll add one last thing to that kind of taking um, <laughs> a, an approach that I take editorially, which is when the, you know, the sort of the question or the matter is big, uh, get, get very specific. Um, you know, specificity helps when you're dealing with broad strokes. And it's, uh, we've done these vault vintage covers and that was a, uh, very conscious decision on, um, Tim Daniels part to, uh, put our books, um, next to the sort of inspiration, uh, visually for so many of our stories. You know, we talk with our creators about very specifically about the stories that, that encourage them to create their works. And then we get to honor those past creators with these vault vintage covers that are homage, homages to uh, these excellent, you know, sort of iconic covers. And that's been, uh, you know, it's really fun, of course, to get to do these covers. And so that's fulfilling. But it's also a very specific tool because if you're a reader who goes into a comic book store, you never heard of vault and you see She Said Destroy on the shelf and you see that you know saga uh number eight homage cover and it says right there like honoring fiona staples on the front and you go oh well if they're equating it with saga and i love saga then maybe i'll pick it up and the same is true for like the madam xanadu cover that we did with for queen of bad dreams or you know we've got uh 
like uh, Sarah and the Royal Stars, we actually did something really fun. We um, we did um, a throwback cover to Heathen number one. And so that way, all these Heathen fans that can go into the shop, see that and go like, wait, is that a Heathen cover? Oh, that's so cool. That's Sarah and the Royal Stars. I picked it up and now I'm flipping through it. I see how stunning Audrey's art is. Maybe I'll give this a shot. If, if that's If that's in its DNA, then maybe I'll love it. And so, you know, that's a very specific example of the kind of, uh, I guess, schemes that we're constantly cooking up and trying to implement to get readers to approach a new brand. Yeah. I mean, the, the Saga one, I mean, that kind of the, the good news about that one is, is it's so recent that I think that it really immediately speaks to a lot of people who might be interested in something like she said, destroy anyways. But, you know, I, I talk to a lot of public or retailers on, on a regular basis. And one of the tricky things is like. There's so much time spent by publishers speaking to, you know, the the real the, the end user for most of them is actually the retailers because they're the ones who are ordering it. But then because so much time has been spent speaking to though to to them, they don't have any time for actually the readers or anything like that. And th- and that's a really tricky part. Like and that's the, I I guess that that's where really where I was kind of getting at is is just like making comics that are great is, is is definitely a good thing. And I'm, and you guys are certainly finding success with it. It's just, I always find it really like hard to like, how do you, how do you make sure that like, not only do they find out that these comics are good, but this comic is for them. I I guess that's the kind of, the kind of disconnect. Like how do you communicate to them that, that this is worthwhile for them? I mean, I wish I had the singular answer. Um, and if you come up with yeah, but, it, please, it, please dude, send it to me an email. <laughs> no, I, I guess I meant strategically. Like, do you have an approach for that? Uh, yes, we we absolutely do. And, um, you know, again, like a very sp- specific small tool that we use uh, that I think speaks to our, our approach. Uh, on the back of all of our books, we have a summary um or synopsis uh i should say not summary and that's just a very simple tool that's been used and i don't know the book market forever and doesn't occur on most comics and means if you're a reader and you pick something up off the shelf and you know nothing about it um or if you're a retailer and somebody comes up and says what's this book about even if you haven't read it you can talk about the book because you have a simple synopsis on the back and those speak to our strategy and our strategy is to try to make our focus that we harp on constantly sci-fi and fantasy uh representing uh new emerging voices telling uh sort of subgenres of sci-fi and fantasy that haven't been represented well um or enough uh basically taking that focus and communicating it with simple small tools to the reader so that they can they can go oh i like sci-fi i like fantasy this is clearly what these guys do i can see it in their design i can pick up the back of i can pick up the book and flip it over and read that i know what they're telling me they do with their books and now that i know that if i enjoy this one i know where to come back and so like i said if you have the perfect answer please tell me <laughs> our our answer so far our strategy has been to not just equip the retailer with the tools that damien was talking about but try to think of small simple tools for readers that help them understand like oh vault is this kind of brand and if i love this one story i can go check out others by them or if i love this story from elsewhere i can see it in the dna here and i know that this is something i want to pick up um, and we continue to cook up, uh, harebrained <laughs> schemes constantly to, um, you know, to continue to, to find the, the tools that work. Some don't, and some have worked brilliantly. Like these vault vintage covers have, have been a huge success. I have had so many, I've seen so many people on Twitter say like, oh man, I saw this Why the Last Man variant cover and that's my favorite series. So then I read this synopsis and was like, this sounds really cool and added it to my pool list. Um, And hopefully we discover many, many more tools like that in the synopses that continue to take our brand focus and communicate them straight through, straight past that like, you know, (laughs) giant three-headed beast and right to the reader. 
Yeah. I, I do really love the synopsis on the back because, you know, in an ideal world, like I'm, I'm sure every shop wishes that they were able to like hand sell to every single person who walked in the store, but it kind of like eases that process because you don't have to have somebody to sell it because the book itself will literally sell it because then you can figure out what the book's about. I mean, for me, like a big thing when I'm walking around the store, which I'm actually going to do after this, I'm going to walk around, you know, my shop and like a lot of times a cover will make me pick it up, but it's like, what's going to sell me on it once I get that in my hands and like having a synopsis in the back. That's, that's really great. I will say also about the vintage covers. One thing I really like about them is they're kind of like a, like a, a single cover, version of like a read if you like stand in like barnes and noble or something like that <laughs> yep it's it's very nice um well i i mean really th- that's all i have for you guys i I was gonna ask you i was just gonna get you to like tout tara ferguson because she's a pal of mine and i know she's working with you guys for white noise marketing but i don't you know she never bought me a spice bag i don't know if you guys have ever been to ireland but if you ever get a chance <laughs> you should go and meet her she's like fantastic I, I i guess i do have to ask like is she working with you guys directly or is that just a white noise connection no she's working with us oh, directly uh for direct market sales and uh pr in the you know uk side of the pond she is so, wonderful hey, Europe, yeah I, she's been phenomenal she's been- also has the most on point goth makeup ever. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> so i take it you've met her I, I I've seen photographs. The last we've never met in person. Oh, okay. Well, I, I actually was just in Ireland last year, and uh, she was she introduced me to a uh, amazing uh, food that they have there, which is a spice bag, which really sounds like it's drugs, but it's actually not. Um, but in, in, anyways, so if you ever get the chance, I'm if you go to Ireland, I'm guessing she will try to push it on you. I have not had it. Because, Are you sure it's not drugs? Uh, you know, <laughs> now, it, now it really sounds like drugs, and I'm gonna go to Ireland. <laughs> Like, could I have a spice bag? And they're gonna be like, "Sir, you have to leave." <laughs> it, it, I think it's one of those like late night drunk foods, basically that has like a mix of like fries and chicken and a bunch of hot, hot and spicy things inside of it. And it's like one of those things you get that just makes you feel amazing when you've been out way too late, which tends to happen when you're in <laughs> Ireland. Uh, like yeah, analog of poutine or something, right? Like, What's that? I said it's like the Irish analog of poutine, right? Like one of these. Uh, French fry based uh, bits of gastronomic madness that you <laughs> eat after midnight. Yeah, that you definitely regret eventually, but can't do anything but celebrate in the moment. Oh yeah, in the moment, it's amazing. I love the the phrase gastronomic madness. That is an incredible <laughs> creation. Um, but anyways, guys, thank you for coming on and talking about all things Vault with me. I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, yeah. thank you so much for having us. It was uh, it was a real pleasure. Yeah, indeed, it was great, um, and and uh, hope to talk to you again sometime soon, and maybe meet face to face at one or other convention. Yeah, maybe we can buy you a spice bag. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with Vault Comics CCO and editor in chief Adrian Wassel and their CEO and publisher Damian Wassel. You can find Adrian on Twitter at at af Wassel and Damian there at Damian Wassel. And their work in Vault Comics and comic shops everywhere. As a heads up, Op Panel is once again brought to you by Sketch.com. Check out the new version of the site and consider subscribing for access to all the site's content in its members-only forum. If you're a fan of Op Panel, make sure to check it out on Patreon. If you back the show on there, you not only support it, but you get early access to each week's podcast, access to weekly content, and more. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Off Panel on iTunes or Spotify and give the show a rating or review while you're at it. You can find Off Panel and Sketched on social media by liking it on Facebook at slash Sketched. That's S K T C H D. Following it on Twitter at, at SketchComic or following me at, at SliceRideGold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Litwin Studios, Alex Dimitriopoulos, Terry Dodson, Troy Jeffrey Allen, Liana Kangas, Kagan Ray, Milton Lawson, Wesley Giff, Sean Kirkham, Mary Small, Alistair Ross, Julio Anta, Gus, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Paul Reinwan, Connor Farner, Vita Ayala, JDC, and Matt Gagnon, Aditya Bidikar, Tara Ferguson, Dave Slusher, Kieran Mark Antonio, WMQ Comics, Akil, Greg Lockard, Kukachi, Phil White, Ben Becker, Sean Pinello, Ken Heidelman, Phil Seavey, Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, Nick Michelin, David Kelly, Robert Wilson IV, Nick Polito, Owen McCready, Brendan Fletcher, Gary Maloney, Jonathan Nelson, Matthew Groom, Jason Nassi, Adam Bogert, Xavier Files, Maria Schweitzer, Matthew Taylor, Tyler Turner, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, David Brawley, Brian McRae, Ira James Udaskin, Modern Magic Stories, Nick 
Patrick Halp, Bobby Bangus, Bjorn Basin, John Hendricks, Steve Aronson, Phil Nall, Ian Maxfield, Cliff Chang, Benjamin Shipper, Cole McMahon, Chris Palmer, Matt Scott McGovern, Nathan Fairburn, Kat McKenzie, Greg Rucka, Adam Highfield, Nicholas Gardner, Andrew Corgan, Fiona Staples, Chris Halloran, Mark Abnett, Mike Murphy, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim DiMonacos, Norbert, Nick Lowe, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics and Art in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks to Upright T-Rex Music, who wrote and performed off panel theme song just for the show. Check out their music on Spotify because it's completely delightful. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode.